But tell me it's so on. Oh my god. Becky. Okay, I think we're good. Cool. Are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, where are you right now? I am sitting in my dining room in uh, Auburn, Washington, about 20 miles outside of Seattle. Oh, nice. I, I have this vision of you, like, actually in your recording studio or something. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, as a matter of fact, as soon as I hang up, that's where I'm going. So. You are? Your okay, so yeah, that? your vision's not far off. Nice. Nice. Um, really, really serious question. How are you doing post-Super Bowl? Are you, like, totally bummed? Um, I'm getting over it now. I mean, I, 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 I tell you what, I didn't know I had that many four-letter words in my vocabulary um, okay. until I until I witnessed the call. Oh my God! What was the what was the word? By the way, you can totally curse if you want to. Oh. Okay. Oh, um, but what what is the worst what is the worst word that you said during the Super Bowl? Uh, probably a combination of fuck and dumb. Um, <laughs> By the way, probably, there's people, there's people probably in reverse there. order. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's a, that's a good one. That's one of my favorites as well. Um, <laughs> that's one of my favorite combos. Um, before we like jump into the interview, I just wanted to make you aware that I'm writing an article for Inc. for South okay. By, and then I'm okay. also recording this for a podcast um, that we're going to publish from my company's site. Um, probably a week or so before South by. Um, and I'm not a journalist by trade. I'm actually on the founding team of a tech company called Air PR, but I write about technology for Mashable and Inc. and Entrepreneur and, and for our blog. So um, I have over the years interviewed and, and written about um, interesting things going on in the tech space. So I think um, Lisa originally reached out because she thought, you know, you have an interesting story, and I, I thought it would be really cool to interview you and just get your take on kind of this convergence of tech and music. Cool. I, I love it. That's that's what I'm into. And um, like I said, I was I was doing technology when it wasn't considered technology. It was just being a dork, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to do is just is kind of talk about a little bit about what you've been up to the past 20 years. I mean, obviously um, – for anyone who's listening, I'm sure that if you if you don't know who Simichlot is, you've been living under a rock. Um, yeah, the butt guy. But, uh, like after the success of Baby Got Back, you obviously went on to do more things. So can you talk a little bit about what that looked like once once that hit um, kind of took you to the top, and then and then what have you been up to since? Well, obviously, um, when I when I when I started this stuff back in the '80s with Posse on Broadway and, and Beepers and My Hoopy and all those songs, um, I thought that I had peaked then. I'm being honest. I thought, okay, that's it, done, made good money, I'm out of here. And then uh, Rick Rubin signed me, and we did Baby Got Back. So um, post Baby Got Back, I found myself trying to find out what was next. I'm not one of these guys that likes to, you know. Um, celebrate the past and constantly live in it, which it seems like a lot of guys do. They get stuck in one spot and they can't move. Um, for me, I kept looking for what's next, what's next. And then I remember kind of late 90s um, when Napster came about. Um, yeah. when, Napster, when Napster happened, I was probably, and I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you the fucking truth, I was probably the only guy that publicly said the record industry is going to die. Yeah, um, wow. because I was complaining early on about our CDs costing nineteen dollars to the consumer. I knew they only took about seventy five cents to make. Why are we marking them up to nineteen bucks? Nobody answered me, and it was more of a thing where you know we just did it because we could. Fuck off! And that was honestly what gave birth to Napster. And of course, we all know Apple stole the Napster business model, legitimized it, and now everybody's on the Apple label. That's really what Apple is—a giant record label. Um, so. I knew then that the landscape was going to change, um, so I started to look at alternative ways to monetize uh, my existing content and not just constantly trying to make new content because people think you're trying to remain relevant uh, when you create uh, – notice I'm saying content, not music. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you create new content, they think you're, it's a desperate attempt to remain relevant, and it may be just because you love to do it. Now, what a concept. So um, I started to uh, – come up with alternative ways to make money. Uh, I started to leverage my publishing and uh, do a lot of ads and things like that and ended up making more than I did at my peak, which is beautiful. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've never thought about that in terms of Apple just being a giant record label. I mean, that's that's a fascinating take on it. And I think I think you're right too. It's like what a freaky, scary thing to be at kind of at the top of your game in the '90s with all that stuff happening. I think that you know, it's kind of it was one of those things like innovate or die. I mean, I I think that those that could adapt and really embrace technology and really look at their career as a brand from all sides are the ones that have, have continued to be relevant. It's interesting. I was actually going to ask you, um, you know, how, how do you stay relevant and in addition to embracing technology? What, what has that looked like for you and how have you done that? Well, you know, I think part of it is don't try. Um, if, you, if you got into music to try to be relevant, you already got in for the wrong reasons. You got to do music because you love it. That's first and foremost. Um, yeah. If you want to be famous, you should find something else to do. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I said is I, I said, you know what? I'm not going to try to remain relevant. I'm just going to do music. I'm just going to have a good time, but at the same time, constantly be aware of the changing landscape. I look at artists like Prince, and and it just don't get me wrong. He's he's my one of my favorite artists of all time, but. Uh, when it came to technology, he's in a tailspin, and he can't get out of it. I, didn't he say the Internet was a fad? Oops. You know, yeah. things of that sort. I just didn't want to ride like that. So what I said I would do is I'd open up, let other brands. Um, I've done biz business with Charmin. I've done business with Target, um, Butterfinger, and the Nestle Corporation, things of that sort. Let these brands know that not only were my songs gettable, but I would create custom masters just for their, uh, just for their use. And once I got that word out, Financially, I was good, so I didn't have to, you know, flail desperately in the wind to get attention. Um, and I kind of focused on um, nothing but the changing landscape and constantly making adjustments, which for me is fun. There are some things that had to go away. Um, the mystique of a great artist, that's, that's over. No more mysterious, yeah. how does Michael Jackson put, put his pants on? That stuff's gone. Um, but that being I said. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I would See? love. I would, do you have insight? I would love to know that. Do you actually no, and, know? And that's the mystique. You don't know how Michael Jackson put his pants on. <laughs> Woo! -hoo. You that's know, bad. that was cool back then. And a lot of artists had trouble accepting the fact. Two things they had trouble accepting. They wanted to lie about how they made it before. First of all, the way we made it before. Yes, we worked hard. Worked hard as hell. That part is true. But to make it look like you went in forced your deal, bullshit. What happened was we worked on music, we worked, we worked, we worked. Some guy that knew a guy next to the guy that was next to the guy that was next to the girl that was next to the girl that knows the guy got us a deal. They signed us. We delivered the package. Mix a lot. Go home. We'll call you when you're a star. and You can go on tour and make a lot of money. That's exactly the, the old model. Now, you're no longer just an artist that gets to sit in a cave and make music and come out whenever the money calls. Now you have to go out and you're a walking, talking brand. Right. And people hate that, but I look at it this way. Imagine being a brand. Imagine being, you know, you sell widgets and your company is Rebecca.com. Imagine being able day to day to interact with, your, with the consumer every day. What is it that you're looking for? What do you want? And that's the advantage we have, but I think a lot of older artists never took advantage of it. Yeah. No, you're you're right, and you see you see them kind of dying on the vine. There's there's a reverse thing that happens though too, which I think is frustrating for people who really do appreciate the art and the music side, which is all of the manufactured stuff that's coming out now, right? So it's like, how do you is is that something you think as a result of technology that's happened? And I I guess I'm probably talking about like boy bands, <laughs> but what you know what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think that's something you know, that's, that's going to happen no matter what, it's inevitable, or is that, like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think when people blame that on technology, that's complete bullshit. I'm going to tell you why. Let's take, let's separate the Beatles, okay? First they were, she loves you, yeah, 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 let it be real music. So let's, let's, let's put the let it be to the side for a minute. She loves you, yeah, 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 that was a fucking boy band, okay? The Jackson 5, A, B, C, boy band. Menudo, boy band. Uh, they, were, they were boy bands forever. Last I checked, new kids on the block and those guys, you know, and I love, I mean, I, I'm good friends with Donnie, so I'm not trying to diss at all. But can you, kids can, on the can block, you keep singing? Can you just keep singing boy band songs, please? <laughs> no, no I can't do that. 
I, I, I can't. Will hear, no, I want to hear New Kids on the Block remixed by Sir Mix a Lot. No, I mean, no, 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 no. I'll pass on that. No. When, I, when I sing, when I sing, it's pure sarcasm. Trust me. I can't sing with the shit. But those bands were around long before technology. So just yeah. like the old days, they're shitty music still. There's always going to be shitty music. But the one thing I like is that in the midst of everybody mimicking Beyonce, in the midst of all of that, Lord came out of nowhere. And right. that is the advantage of technology. It didn't take some, some guy at the top to finally look, scrape around the bottom and find her. Um, she could get right to the consumer, and the consumer drove her to where she ended up. And that's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, and you're right. It's like it flipped the model on its head. That's yep. really what's going on. Um, uh, jumping into the social media side, so we are going to get – I do want to talk about South by and kind of what you're doing there, um, but I would love to hear your thoughts on social media. Are you into it? Where do you draw the lines in terms of privacy? Are you just kind of everywhere, anything? What, what's your – um, you know, I'm in the social media. I, I'm not. I don't. I don't post pictures of my toes. And uh, I, I got up and took a dump this morning. It was like six o'clock as opposed to nine. You know, I don't, I don't do that kind of stuff. I am so grateful that you don't do yeah. that. Thank yeah, you. I can. I can give you my my dump patterns and on a, off 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 the record. You know, I think so Uber. Like I think Uber may have those actually. <laughs> they may but, actually be tracking you. But I, you know, it's funny. I initially, when I got into this social media thing, I had this. I hired this guy, and this guy uh, blew my numbers up like crazy. I had started a Twitter page. He blew it up, and I canceled it. I threw the whole thing out. Why? Because it was a bunch of people. He just he would go follow Michael Jordan or Jay Z, make a comment. A bunch of people see the comment and they follow me because it said Mixlot, but they weren't engaged. And I, I could say something, and they'd be like, who the fuck are you? Why am I following you? I mean, they'd ask that literally a month after they hit the follow button. So I I scrapped it. Um, I redid my whole thing. I called it the real mix. And now I don't have a shitload of followers, but every single follower, did, none of it came from any kind of PR work. It's all just me commenting on something, talking about something, especially technology. Probably 50% of the people that follow me are into technology, not just music. Um, and that's what I believe. I believe that social media, when used properly, can be awesome. If you only use it to sell shit, you're going to suck. If you only yeah. use it to cuss people out, you're going to suck. It's a, it's a fine balance um, that you have to strike. And I don't think it – there's no – it cracks me up when I see these companies that specialize in doing that for people. I'm like, that's impossible. There's an algorithm that follows each person or each company, each brand, and um, there's no – one way to do it, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that, that's that's interesting as well. But I think that it just depends. A lot of it depends on your comfortability level too. Yes, I it does. For me, it's really like more work focused, and I use Instagram very little Facebook at this point. But Instagram to kind of really document where I'm going and, and people I'm with and things like that. But um, I think the thing around privacy, though, especially when you're a celebrity or, or you have a high profile. Are you taking a dump? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! If you if you if you knew, you'd swear I was swimming with Jaws. Don't worry about it. <laughs> what about Instagram? Do you use Instagram at all? Um, you know what? I, I I have a buddy of mine that keeps getting on my ass. He's like, dude, you need to use Instagram more often. It's like, but I I, I guess me, I've always been kind of a modest dude. I don't really see what I do as that interesting, and then I post something and get crazy comments. So I I guess it is interesting to some people. So I need to start using it more. Facebook, I. Somebody has to remind me to use Facebook lately. Um, yeah, it's Twitter. Has, I, Twitter I use a lot because Twitter's not static. Value. Sorry, it probably has more value. Um, I think with Instagram and Facebook, especially if you're not posting a ton, if you're just posting like, you know, once in a while something really cool. I think yep. that that tends to have a little bit more value. If you're kind of taking a lot of risks in your career, there's like big failures. There's big ups and big downs. Yes, um, yes, then, there is. Yeah, and if you fail, it's like you make a you make a, a bad decision, and then like something else comes out of it, and so yep. that it tends to be better. But um, what is the instance of which that actually didn't happen, and it was just a bad decision, and you and you maybe wish you would have made a different one? Um, I had a couple of them. Okay, one of them funny, and one of them not so funny. The not so funny one was the ignorant decision I made, and I knew better. 
the ignorant decision I made on the Chief Bootknocker record, which was the record after Mac Daddy, which had Baby Got Back on it, mm -hmm. um, was to try to replicate the effect of Baby Got Back. When Baby Got Back wasn't written as a sexual song, I used sexual references to make it interesting. But it actually was a serious song about women of color. And at that time, the only time you saw women of color on TV is when they either looked like a maid, housekeeper, you know, or they assimilated to another culture. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to talk about it without sounding like Malcolm X. So that's why I did Baby Got Back, and it kind of worked. Some people got it. The people that didn't didn't give a shit. They bought it anyway. Great song. But I got cocky, and I said, I'm going to do it again. So I did this song called Put Them on the Glass, right? So it's like, okay, we're not, we're not going to talk about butts. Now we're going to talk about titties. Yes. <laughs> this will be deep. <laughs> And, <laughs> yeah, and don't get me wrong, the song sold. The song did great numbers, but what happened, it, 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 in, a, in a subtle way, it kind of diluted um, what Baby Got Back was all about. Um, mm -hmm. And it, and it kind of diluted what I'm all about. So it, 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 did, it wasn't a great, a great move career-wise. Um, I think it kind of minimized who I was. Bad move, but the stupidest fucking thing I ever did on the funny side I, I called myself giving back to the kids. So they wanted me to do this ad um, for kids reading books and to get more kids to read, um, which is kind of weird considering the Internet is where they read. But anyway, so I did this voice stupid-ass rap song, and I didn't think it would blow up. And it's, now it's all over the Internet of me. I'm a fucking raisin. <laughs> I'm literally a raisin in this ad and there's, I'm reading books and shit, and I'm books. Check them out. I'm like, what the fuck, man? God oh, that, damn. That, are you, that. Oh, that was are you, fucked up. Are you offended that we're laughing? Is that okay? <laughs> oh, no. I'm, hell, I laugh at it now. And I look at that, I'm like, I'm, I'm glad my career is still around. Shit. That was, whew, that was bad. I mean, I've done a few, a few bad things, but that one right there, people get on me like, they'll be like, Mix, man, uh, you know, when I saw that, I kind of. I, I didn't know whether to loan you five dollars or laugh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's the best. That's the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah. I, I'm glad that I'm glad though that you talk about it as like a bad decision, and you can kind of laugh about it because some people will just go, "Oh yeah, I, I did that, and it was for the kids, and it was totally awesome." And you're just like, "No, that I was, was fucked up." <laughs> it's, okay. you know, what's funny is that people cry about those decisions, but to me. Um, and I learned this from an entrepreneur, a entrepreneur friend of mine. He told me, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people make money and go broke, but real wealth is when you go broke and come back because you'll never do it again. You'll never go broke again. And right. so I had some issues at the end of the 90s. You know, I had some bad habits, man. I was, I was buying Lamborghinis like, it was, like they were flapjacks. Um, and it was only because of where I'd come from. I didn't, really didn't have, um, you know, where I came from, you know, just having a car was the ultimate. And once I busted that bubble and realized that I needed to be a little more vertical in the way I live my personal life, um, I changed that. So when I went through all that shit, I, I came out of it shining. Because you got to learn from those mistakes. You can't really sit up and cry about them all the time. Yeah. So the, mo so the moral of the story is don't try to do things that help kids read better. <laughs> <laughs> no more charity work for you. It's basically where we're going with it. I've been to, I've like, been asked to do some fucking crazy stuff. I got asked to play um, the transvestite in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I've been yes. asked to do some weird shit. Yes. Oh yes. I, I do have a serious question. I really have a serious question. Have you ever been asked to stand in for Ice T on Law and Order Special Victims Unit? The only way I'd get asked to do that, and Ice T's a good friend of mine too. And the only way that I could get asked to do that is if I lost about eighty pounds. Oh. Then they'd probably ask me. They probably because people always say, "You look, you guys could be cousins or whatever." I'm like, uh, "Yeah, but Ice T, you know, but Ice T lifts weights and shit, you know. That's my thing. I'm just starting to lift weights. I lost ten pounds, and I think I'm, I think I'm fucking Denzel now. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's amazing. I thought, yeah, you guys like have like when I first pulled up your profile. I mean, I think the pictures I've seen of you were from quite a while ago. And then I told him, like, wow, he really looks like Ice T. That's crazy." He yeah, he's, I mean, it's funny because Ice T back in the day for me um, was, uh, you know, like a, in a weird, in, he was indirectly a mentor. He didn't try to be, but he said something to me one day. I was doing an interview, 
And, you know, this is back in the gangster rap days, right? So I'm doing I this know, interview. I know a lot about gangster rap. I'm okay. definitely, I definitely know a lot about that. Well, he was, he was kind of there, and I was doing an interview, and he probably didn't even remember this because he had a lot of shit on his mind then. But I was, like, talking shit. Yeah, so this my motherfucker E Dog. Yeah, this motherfucker been known to smoke a nigga, you know? And blah blah I'm talking all this shit, but that's not me. Right? So when right. I finished, I never will forget Ice T was up next and they were at a, <laughs> on a commercial break and he goes, Why'd you just do that, man? He said, what? I said, What are you talking about? I said, Why did you just act like a dumb fuck when you're not? <laughs> you know, and he really I mean, I never forgot that. Now I told him that one day and he's like, I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. I don't remember doing it, but he did do it and I never ever forgot it and from that day forward the way i interview i'm me and there's yeah. nothing uh nothing fake about it okay so oh i want to know who inspires you like who do you look for for i mean besides probably just the things you do to get in the creative space but what people inspire you who do you like to have around you know it's kind of weird in in physically around nobody i can't seem to especially um, when I'm doing stuff that has to do with technology. If I'm wiring something, because I build a lot of huge power supplies, high-voltage stuff, um, big RF amplifiers, all that stuff. Um, and when I'm doing that, because I'm dealing with, you know, potentially lethal amounts of voltage and current, I have a tendency to want to be alone. But um, I'm often inspired by people that shock a lot of people. Obviously, Muhammad Ali, number one. I mean, that's everybody's going to say that. James Brown, everybody's going to say that. That's musical. But... Honestly, I get motivated by weird fuckers like, you know, like Steve Jobs. I mean, that cat could sell cookies to a fucking diabetic. You know, I mean, this guy could just, <laughs> seriously, I mean, th just the way he believed in his product. And when it sucked, he would publicly say, that yeah. shit sucked. You know, that really sucked. We shouldn't have done that. And I, for that, for me, that dude to me is like incredible. I think um, pretty much the majority of the startups I go to Startup Weekend up here with Techstars. I went up, went to that one one weekend. Um, I do have some problems um, with with that model, but you know we'll deal with that if you ask. But those guys even inspire me. I, I'm good good friends with Keith Smith, and he's done a couple of companies. Yeah. Um, that have that have made some pretty good money, and and I, I get inspired by that because the interesting thing about people from about 25 to 35, the interesting thing about them is that. It's kind of weird that failure doesn't scare them at all. They're just doing what they love doing, and if they happen to make money at it, then they step on the accelerator. Um, but there are some downsides to the mentality of 20 and 30-somethings, but I get, I get, people get mad at me when I bring it up. So. No, I, I definitely want to get into that. I, I'm definitely going to talk about it because I, yeah, I want, I want to hear, like, what are some of the downsides? Because, you know, it's, so, you know, I live in Silicon Valley. It's like the company's here. It's easy to get caught in the bubble. And then when you get outside of it, you're like, oh, we live in a bubble. This isn't really how things operate anywhere else. So what are your thoughts on that? What do you think the downsides are? What's the mentality that bothers you? Well, I think, I think, that, um, I think that many people got caught up in the Twitter slash Facebook business model. They thought, let's make some shit. And this is what happened at Startup Weekend. They were making really cool apps and stuff. And um, every time one of the VCs or one of the, one of the judges asked, so you're looking for how much money? Uh, you know, let's say a couple hundred thousand. Look for a couple hundred thousand. What, how do I make money on this application? Well, we haven't really figured that out yet. I'm like, what the fuck? How do you, how do you look somebody square in the eye and ask them for a million bucks and go, <laughs> I haven't really figured out how to make your money back yet. I mean, can you imagine those motherfuckers fucking with the mafia? I, it just blows my mind that, and I, you know, I was trying to figure out where did this problem come from. So we, we being me and my manager, did a panel at the University of Washington, and then I saw it. I listened to this professor, this has been years now, telling these kids, <clears throat> do what you love to do. Don't really worry about making money. Just do what you love. Now, I don't call that prepping a kid for life. Right. I mean, yeah, that's, that's fun. If you want to have a hobby, that's great. But to me, um, there's something lost between that generation and the brick-and-mortar guys from my generation. There's a, there's a combination that needs to be had to maximize any product that's created. Um, and, and I think that 
the most successful companies that I've seen, there's always a guy laying in the weeds that is, is, is about that is about that bankroll. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. When they say they don't care about money, bullshit. Tell your landlord that. Yeah, <laughs> you know? especially in San Francisco. Yeah, uh, well, trust me. I, I, I'm in San Francisco often. I'll be there on the 27th of this month. And yeah, it's just oh, uh, you're, it's you're nasty. They're coming to visit, they're coming to the office. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think it, it, it is kind of like disconcerting when you are, I mean, we raised $5 million bucks at our company, uh-huh. and, and we're building real products. We have customers, and, you know, you see these guys, and I would say guys is a generalization because that's usually what it is, right. coming out of school, 22, 23, expecting to build, you know, a an app and raise twenty million dollars and think, yeah, we don't we don't have to we don't have to know exactly what we're doing yet. We can we can monetize it later. And I think that is a shift in thinking. Like, you know, yeah. imagine, yep. imagine if you wrote a song and recorded a song, I'm like, eh, you know, maybe we're not really sure anyone's gonna buy it. But maybe they will, but we don't really know yet. Like you don't go into the recording studio thinking no one's gonna buy this. You go <laughs> exactly. In, you know, it's it's just a weird it's a weird mentality and I think it also leads a lot of times to this entitlement complex that, by the way, doesn't exist in, like, normal America, which is no, it does not. Silicon Valley and New York and L.A. and places like that. So I think it's easy to get to think that that's just the the norm, but it's, it's really not. I think it's just in certain places it is. Um, yeah, and, you know, one, one thing I noticed um, that, that really, I won't say it offended me, but it was laughable when I saw it, was companies that celebrated funding. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying, oh, wow, we, you know, we really needed this $5 million injection. This is awesome. We're going to go forward. That's great. Now, when I say celebrate, I mean, and I've been a part of them. I've been paid to do shows for some of these companies. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with these guys? you got $5 million of someone else's money, and you're going you're gonna to pay me two grand to stand in a fucking mansion and completely destroy it. <laughs> I mean, it's just fucking ignorant, man. I'm like, what are you doing? Why? That's like me celebrating getting a home loan. <laughs> for my business, yeah, for my business is great. But I can tell you this: if somebody were, because I have a company I just started called True Human Interface, and we're going to build some really cool shit. And I'm going to bootstrap most of it. I'm going to, you know, probably fund the first couple hundred, maybe maybe quarter mil. And after that, when I have something I can really show a VC, um, then I'm going to you know, roll it out, but you're not going to see me getting that guy's money and then throwing a big party and he's sitting there looking at me like, what the fuck? Right. No, I'm going to get this guy back his money as fast as I can, or this gal or whatever, as fast as I can. That, that's something that I never have understood. And maybe it's the culture. I've had meetings with some of these cats. I was down in, in uh, Silicon Valley down there, which is, I hang out all the time. WSGR is my firm down there. And, um, I went down and had a meeting. Now, this, this is the funny. This is another thing that kind of cracks me up. So I get these fucking MIT whiz kids, smart as hell. I love MIT grads, by the way. Um, but I think they thought I was stupid because I didn't talk in fucking acronyms. God <laughs> damn. <laughs> I have the same problem. <laughs> and the fucking buzzwords, well, platform and vertical. Now, shut the fuck up, man. <laughs> God damn. Oh, God damn. And my thing is, you know, I, I noticed that some of them had trouble, not trouble, but they seem to lose a little respect for you if you just talk like a regular guy, but you knew what you were talking about. Um, and this guy was talking saying about, the word disruptive, you'll be fine. Just oh, say. yeah, disruptive. That's another one, Johnny. Yeah, it's very disruptive. Very disruptive. Very disruptive. Yeah, what, what, is, what, yeah, what is that, a shitty song being played backwards? What do you mean, disruptive? <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? I mean, come on, man. Wait, will you but, please, please write a rap about disruption? And then I, I, it. I am going to write a rap about startups because I do love technology. I tease the shit, but I love it. Um, and I love what some of these young companies, young guys running, young gals running companies are doing. I love that shit. But... I do have these issues I have are real. And I don't know. I don't know who's going to start listening, but somebody better start listening because this shit is, that shit has no, to I, stop. I think, I think what's going to happen, honestly, because, you know, just seeing it and being in it, I, I think what's going to happen is technology is becoming already so ubiquitous and it's really converging with every other industry. So by nature, it, it will become more mainstream and it won't be as marked as a difference, like in terms of right. language and, 
the lexicon that people use and all this stuff, it's going to have to become more accessible to people to kind of narrow that gap between the digital natives and, and immigrants, the digital immigrants. Thank you, Lita. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, the word is immigrants. <laughs> um, so this is a great segue. Uh, you're going to South By. We're definitely going to be there. By the way, have you ever been? No, I'm a, I'm a South by Southwest virgin, so I can't wait. It is such a shit show. I mean, like a legit shit show. It's now, that's awesome. That's, that's the shit. I can't, but you know what's funny is that for years I thought it was just, I don't do too many music conferences because I found out it's just a bunch of artists sitting around stroking each other's dicks, telling each other how great they are, and I can't stand that kind of stuff. Ah, uh, the circle jerk. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You grab me, I grab you. You're fucking great. Love it. Um, so I, I, but then I found out it had a lot to do with technology, and like I said, I can't wait to um, to get down there. And I see circuitry scares the shit out of me, even though I'm starting to understand it. Um, but I'm realizing that the guys dealing in IC stuff, they have trouble with high amounts of current and RF, and they don't really know how to move that across a PC board. So it's kind of like a, a interesting marriage that I'm trying to create for my company. That uh, I think going down there is going to really help me to get there. I can't yeah. wait, man. It's, We'll That's definitely fine. we'll plug you into some events too. We have some stuff going on down there. Um, but but I would love to hear a little bit more about the the accelerator, um, the contest. I know. So I have here your your publicists are ex- extremely adept. By the way, they're great. They send me all the information. <laughs> um, so you're an MC along with uh, Lori Segal, I think from CNN, and um, the senior editor at SAS Company, Chris Gannon. Um, did you know those guys? Is this just randomly you were plugged in? Hell no. How did that even happen with, with uh, the accelerator? Well, my my publicist, uh, Joey, um, Joey kind of hooked me up um, with this, and I told him. I said, look, man, I don't want to be standing in front of a bunch of people who are ten times smarter than me trying to act like I'm teaching them something. But what I would like to bring to the stage is a different perspective on technology, because everybody, a bunch of smart fucks sitting around judging the smartest fuck, that's not really a way to sell something to the general public. But me, I'm going to be kind of the layman. I'm going to be the end user with a microphone. Um, And that's kind of what I plan on bringing to the forefront. I'm going to try not to be too too critical of the companies. I don't think that's going to be my job. Um, But I I tell you one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think they they need that. It tends to get really kind of like serious and, and mundane and people, you know, people in tech tend to take themselves super seriously. But yep. I think that's why it's great to have people like you in there. Um I can see it though, like, you know, first the accelerator and then the next thing you know you're gonna be on Shark Tank as a judge, which is gonna be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shark Tank I like, actually. I, I like Shark Tank because there's a beautiful balance. It's more real world. There's a beautiful balance yeah. between technology and brick-and-mortar companies. It's really cool. Yep, no, I agree. Um, so that's, so the South by Southwest Accelerator is Saturday, March 14th, and Sunday, March 15th at the Hilton. Um, and I, I really do look forward to, to meeting you and kind of hanging out. And I think the what I'd love to do for the Inc. article is to really get your take on, like, the trends you saw at South By, and we'll do an interview um, around that, just kind of like what are the most inter- interesting things that you have seen come out of it, uh, what were some of your favorite companies, that kind of that kind of stuff. Oh, I can't um, wait. I can't wait. I know I'm going to have some answers, too, because I'm going to – I intentionally told my publicist, you know, I'll do a few things. I may perform at a couple of private parties, but I need my walk-around time, seriously. I, need yeah. to, I want to just walk around, see some shit. I want to be in the audience, um, watching a few panels, listening to people. I, I'm also doing a panel, uh, what is it called? The Convergence of some shit. I forgot what it's called. But it's basically music and technology coming together in different ways to kind of monetize things nowadays versus, you know, uh, my heyday. So that, that'll that be a lot of fun to talk about that. And the old guys get really pissed when I talk about this stuff. So I think you're good, though, in terms of the jargon. I mean, you just said convergence and monetizing the same thing. So I, think, <laughs> I really think you're good. I think that you're, you're going to be good. Um, we actually, our investor has a party, and I'll send you this information. Our investor has a party on Monday night. What well, you, you know what? If you're, if you're um, interested, and just, just between us here, please, be so is considering giving me a show. 
Um, and what I, I, I threw the idea out. I said, you know, if I do the show, I, I want to be um, the guy that starts the company. I want to be the guy that has a widget, and he's trying to figure out how to structure his company to best get funded and, uh, you know, to best get shit happening. And I, it, it would be awesome if we do that show to have you guys on, you know. Yeah, we so, love it. We're that in. would be great. That would be great. What, now, what exactly do you guys do? You told me about $5 million, and that was it. Yeah, so we just we just shop really with the money. We just go shopping. Cool. Every, um, no, so Sharon, the CEO, is here, and um, he he started the company four years ago. Brought me in about six months later, um, and we build PR analytics. So we're essentially really short stories that we're measuring the ROI of PR for the first time. So you can track your PR efforts all the way down to revenue. Wow. Um, yeah, it's it's fun. We have. We have a lot of fun. Lita's here, too. She's our PR engineer. She does a lot of the customer management and content. And our engineers are obviously working, and we're just hanging out. <laughs> but, now, would, th- would this apply to all industries, or, or, or is it just a – I mean, would anybody be able to use this? Could I, could I apply it to, say, my sales of music, sales of merchandise, things of that sort, or is it just yeah, a – Yeah, so Sharon's going to jump in here. Sharon wants to say hi. <laughs> hey, Anthony. It's Sharon. How are you doing? What's going on? Not much, man. Um, what I was going to say is you, you can actually apply it. One of the things we've gotten uh, uh, some folks reaching out to, CAA and some of the folks like that are looking at doing it for some of their celebrities um, in advance of uh, movie studio sales and things like that for different pictures. Um, so happy to explore to see if there's a way to make it work uh, with your end. The only downside is that <clears throat> if uh, if you don't own the property by which the sale occurs, it can be a little tricky to tie it together, but something we can we can figure out. One of the things I was going to say, though, is that uh, um, I used to be a VC, and so I, I've gone to South by for about four or five years now. And uh-huh. if, if your goal at South by, I don't know if your goal is just to walk around and hang out with folks, or if you want to see more investors um, and, and that stuff, I'm happy to introduce you or bring you to some of the parties that uh, uh, a lot of the VCs are throwing, if that's uh, interesting to you. I would love to because I, I think that um, I, I don't uh, come up with ideas in a vacuum. You know, uh, that doesn't pay well. I try to come up with ideas that I think I would like, and then I try to see how they work not only across uh, the entertainment industry but, you know, across other other industries. And that's what I think I've come up with. But for me, I don't really know how to structure a company to where it's attractive to a VC. So to be able to talk with them and, and get a better understanding, even – hear them comment on some of the companies they see on panels, it'll probably uh, make me a lot stronger going forward. So, yeah, I, I, I would love that. Oh, yeah. When, yes. when, are you, when are you coming to SF? So maybe you could just swing by the office and we could, we could meet real quick and just kind of try to get an idea so we could do some, some calls and emails in advance in South by. If you're going to be here, like, what are you saying, two weeks? I'm, yeah, I'm leaving. I got, I got Vegas on the 24th. And what? I drive everywhere. <laughs> Wait, are you really in Vegas? Our, our whole team is going to be there. That's hilarious. Are you going to be there on the 24th? For the, where, I'm going for that mobile DJ thing. So um, how long are you guys going to be in Vegas? For a night. We're flying our whole team there as a celebration. Oh, okay. Shit, I don't want to ruin that with business. You guys would be coming. I know. You're, you're coming. You're coming. <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding? Oh, oh, wait a minute. You guys have a former VC. If he's drunk, I really want to see him in. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, he's the one that's uh, he's flying us out in this plane. Yeah, so that's we're getting there. Okay, we, I need I need to see a drunk VC. That's the guy. That's the guy I want to talk to. <laughs> You'll see a lot of them actually. Yeah, yeah, the drunk engineers would be really hilarious. Yeah. This is so much fun. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, we will, like I said, I'll I'll let you know what content is going to come out of this. We're definitely going to post the interview, like as a most of the interview. Obviously, not this last part, but with your number and everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> As a yeah. Yeah. Um, if you could push that with the Fifty Shades of Grey release, that would be awful. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to do that. Happy to do that. Yeah, and then we'll we'll talk about South by. I mean, not kidding. Like our entire team is going to Vegas on the twenty fourth. We're doing like we're going to be up all night and out. So if you're around, we should you know we should try to meet up. That'd be really fun. I will be there. That's for sure. I better be there. I got to get paid. Yeah. <laughs> what is, What are you doing? Are you in skiing? Are you performing? What are you doing? There's a mobile DJ conference down there, and, um, you know, being a, the fact that I used to be a DJ, I'm, I always have a loyalty to them, so they, they got me a little cheaper than usual. But to go to Vegas and get paid for it, fuck that, I'm in. Yeah. Do it. 
Awesome. You know, yeah, so maybe I'll be down there. Maybe we'll swing. Maybe we'll swing by. Um, regardless, we will be in touch. And um, thank you again so much. This was so much fun. I hope you had fun. <laughs> I did. I love it. I love this kind of stuff because it's real. I'm super excited about the show. That's it's so amazing. That would be great. Well, well I haven't agreed to it yet because it, it would it would mean I have to. You know, I fuck. I don't know if I need another job. You know what I mean? But yeah, my thing is con- trying to expand my brand and trying to trickle in the technology without abandoning my music, which is what so many people make the mistake of doing. Is that they go, I'm bigger than Baby Got Back. I want to do technology now. Nobody gives a fuck then because you just, right. you know. So I have to kind of go. It has to kind of go hand in hand, and trying to make this shift without offending my my fans is is it's it's walking a tightrope. You know, so I, I gotta. I got to get it straight. <laughs> so I want to yeah, make sure I do it, it is, right. It is a fine line. And that's something, too, um, I'd love to give you some insight on because I think, you know, I have worked with a lot of entertainers in the past that have kind of segued into the technology entrepreneur realm. And I know Sharon has thoughts on that, too. But it, it is, it's a fine line, you're right, because if you don't have the fan base and you kind of abandon that altogether, in a sense, you that is your brand. So it's got to right. be done in a really strategic way so that the yep. story and the narrative kind of works. Still. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, because you can't be like random rapper guy who all of a sudden is like an analyst on Bloomberg. That would just be. <laughs> you know, it's like right. who is that? Wait a second, is that? Oh my God, that's that's the mix a lot. What is he doing? It would, yeah, I mean, know. I'm good friends with uh, Enrique, and he's a good friend of mine who's a who's a um, pretty pretty large VC up here in the state, and he uh, he got on me about that too. He's like, look, man, he said because he, he put me on a panel here up here for a, a few startups and it's kind of fun to be on the panel, but he's like, you've got to constantly be mixed a lot, even when you're talking technology or else um, you're going to abandon a fan base that you have for a fan base that you don't yet have. And so I yeah. definitely want well, to make I think, sure I keep in touch I with that. I think there's also a way to build kind of the tech side where you are investing in companies that make sense for your story. Or, you know, so right. that, that there's some sort of connection there. Um, anyway, it's all really fascinating, and I, I would, I'll put some thought around it um, and kind of get back to you, and maybe we can just chat about it when you're here. Um, anyway, all right. Yeah, and the, and the key for uh, us, and uh, us being me and, me and uh, Joey, we've talked about that he really thinks it's important that people know that I'm coming up with the ideas. These are not somebody pitching me, and I'm going, okay, I'm going to back it. You know, these are ideas that I sit down with, graph paper and literally, literally draw um, right. and then start trying to uh, to manufacture shit myself, which is fucking crazy. I'm stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> it takes That's too long. Problem. I had to learn how to write code, write code in a month. No, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Well, you have, you, have to, you have to do what you do best and then outsource the rest of it. You know, exactly. I mean, that's really, you've got to keep that creative, you've got the creative mind and, and that part of it down. So you've got to find good people to have around yep. you. Uh, really, this is like a so random question, and I, I swear I'll let you go. Why do you live in Seattle and not, like, L.A. or New York? Um, because, you know, well, I was born and raised in Seattle, number one. But, oh, got and it. I, I got family here. But number two, and because I've had a couple of, um, pardon the pun, number two, but uh, I have a couple of, <laughs> couple of projects I've done, TV shows where I where I was I was asked to move to L.A. As a matter of fact, oh. this is pitching me on one right now, and they're asking me to move to L.A. But I think if I moved to L.A., I would lose something that makes me me, and that's always concerned me. I, I want to – I got to stay 100% Seattle. I think I'd turn – I can't be Ice Cube. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, just got to be me. I, I don't want to change it. I don't want to lose whatever that something is. I might not have my finger on it like I think I do. So I said if I stay in Seattle, I know I won't lose it. So that's why I do it. But I travel a lot. That's for damn sure. Yeah. No, I, I like it. That makes sense. I like the, the kind of having the home base and the probably makes you feel, you know, safe in that way. And then you can go off and do all the other things. Yep. But I, but like I say, when I see you in Vegas, I, you won't know I'm from Seattle. Trust me. Okay. Well, I look yeah. forward. And you will have no idea that we're from San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know what that means, but if, we're going to bring it. You better watch. You better all watch. right. Well, I'll be designated driver if you need one. All right. Well, we appreciate right. it. Thank you so right. much again. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.